morning, everyone. Welcome to My Victory Church. We're so excited to have you all with us. A special welcome to all of you watching us online uh, or on Facebook Live, wherever you are around the world. A special welcome to all of you. We are continuing our series called An End of an Era. And this series is all about the end of religion and how Jesus, I know this is a shock to many of us, even those of us who've been in church our entire lives, Jesus is not a religious leader and it should not be compared to a lot of the other religious leaders. Jesus is so different. In fact, in the first 300 years of the church, Christianity and those who followed Jesus were actually considered the anti-religion. And Jesus was rejected and, and sentenced to death by religion. And that's the, that's the truth because he was such a standout. He was so different than everybody else. And he so offended the religious principles that, that and he came in one of the most religious times in all of history, you know, the battle between the Jews and even the religions and the different sects of religions within, within the Jewish culture at that time, plus the world and how it was divided was divided by religions. And yet Jesus came in the middle of it and offered something completely different and really ended the era of religion. And yet here we are thousands of years later and we still have to go through this and we still have to talk through this because we have now turned Christianity and the, the, the laws of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus into religion. And the reason why we do that is because human tendency is we think that what Jesus offered is too good to be true and it's and there must be a more difficult way and we create our own ways which is what religion is we create our own ways and systems and rituals to get to God and we take Jesus's teachings and we turn them into rituals and and, and structures and we we talked about this last week about we take a principle that Jesus taught like you know a red chair principle that you should not look at uh, uh, you know, you should not sit in a red chair and we turn that into you should not even look at a red chair to where you shouldn't even be in the room with the same red chair to you can't shop at Ikea anymore because they have red chairs. And we turn these principles, these, these, these thoughts, these teachings into a human tradition. And Jesus came to end human tradition and this whole series is about ending that human tradition again, going back to the principles that Jesus taught now, and, and to see how Jesus broke the rules. Now Jesus over the past number of weeks, we've seen how Jesus broke the rules constantly. But I want to make something very clear, is that Jesus never made rule-breaking uh, a lifestyle. He never, he never turned it into, uh, to expose, you know, he didn't turn it into, into something in and of itself. Okay, that was not his goal in and of itself, was just to break the rules and to be a rebel. Okay, Jesus' rule-breaking lifestyle appeared to expose his obvious disregard, you know, it seemed to, and appeared to, it, it looked like to the religious leaders that he disregarded the Torah or the Old Testament. But that is not what Jesus was doing at, at all. Jesus, in, in fact, explains himself in, in his most famous sermon, one of his first ones, the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to look at this in Matthew chapter 5. And look at what Jesus said. And this seems contrary now to everything that we've looked at over the last uh, couple of weeks. But look at, he says th this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now think about this. Why does Jesus even have to say? Why does Jesus have to even have to clarify to the people listening to him, don't think that I have come to abolish the law. The reason why Jesus had to do this is because, he, because everyone is thinking that he is against the Torah, that he's against the Old Testament, that he's against Moses' writings, he's against the prophet Isaiah, he against, he's against all these things. And Jesus is making it clear, don't think, don't think, don't think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them. This is what he says, but to fulfill them. <laughs> what in the world does that mean? Then he says this, he begins to clarify a little bit. He says this, for I truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, okay, we haven't got there yet, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen will be by any means, dis would by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. In other words, he says, we cannot disregard the Old Testament saying we're only going to live by New Testament. We're only going to live by Jesus' teachings. He says, don't do that. He says, we're not going to wipe all, all of that out. We're not, gonna, we're not getting rid of any of that. It still has something to, to accomplish. Okay, yet he seemed, it, which, which to the people listening going, yeah, but Jesus, you broke the laws. You have, you have taken and, and, and disregarded a lot of, of, of what was written and what was taught. So what could he possibly mean? He goes on. He says this in uh, 
I want, let me just back up for a second. Before we go on to the next one, Jesus says, says you know, when they talked about this, there's, I want to give you specific instances in the, in the New Testament, in Jesus' teachings, where he seemed to directly contradict the law. And, and one of the examples is this. The first one is he, can, he totally disconnected the dietary law that was written in Leviticus 11, Okay, and in Mark 7, he seemed to directly contradict the Leviticus 11 law. That's not the only one he did. The second one is, is he de- seemed to absolutely dis, uh, disconnect and, and, and contradict Moses' laws on divorce that are, are clear in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1 to 4. And, and in Matthew 5, and we see this in Matthew 19, we see that he seems to go contrary to that. So that's not the only one. He, he seemed to d- directly contradict the Sabbath laws of Exodus 20. And, and in John 5, and in, in, you know, in John 5 and ni- verse 5, and, and, and uh, going on to verse 16 and 17, he seemed to do that. Now, the other one is that he directly contradicted some of the health laws and, and some of the laws made in Leviticus 13 and 14. And in Matthew 8, he seemed to directly contradict it. So Jesus' words... And actions are very difficult for religious people to, to fathom this time. And Jesus is saying, okay, this is why everyone's saying, why, you know, you're abolishing this. You're stopping this. You're contradicting that. And Jesus is saying, no, no, don't think that I've come to contradict just to contradict. He, he's, he, it's not clear yet, but he says in verse 19, he says this. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And I think a lot of the religious leaders are going, but you're one of those. You're one of the ones that are setting aside these laws. And you're saying that if we do this, you're warning us, if you do this, they will be called least. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But he, you know, they, they're looking at him, aren't you contradicting yourself? But Jesus presses in deeper. Look at this. He, he takes it even further. And this verse would have freaked everybody out. Look at this. He says this in verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees. Whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus. We've seen this all throughout the the last number of weeks. Look at these things. Jesus seems to directly contradict the Pharisees. He calls them out on their human traditions. We looked at that last week. And he says, man, and he seems to absolutely disregard their entire process. And yet he says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. What is he saying? Because here's what the people listening would have thought. I mean, they're looking at each other and they're thinking, there's no way that I can be as righteous, you know, right standing as a Pharisee. Because the truth is, everybody would have thought that day, if, you know, if, if a Pharisee family moved in next to you, that wouldn't be such a bad thing. Because, you know, they're, they're, they're perfect people. They're the perfect neighbors. We, we may not agree with them. They may knock on our door every once in a while in, in suits and ties and try to convert us. But, but they're not bad people to live beside because, man, they never yell at each other. They don't make noise. You know, they keep their, their yard perfect and their... They, they're, we are hardly hear from them at all. And they're not bad people. And they're model citizens. They're perfect. In fact, we're always wishing and we're always kind of conscious of, of our kids getting a little bit too loud and, and that they're gonna, the neighbors might hear us fighting and scrapping as husband and wife. And we're always worried about that. There's no way we could possibly live up to that. That's what everybody's thinking. That's listening to Jesus and going, yeah, there's no way that we could live up to this. Jesus, what are you saying? We have to be better people than the hyper-devout Pharisees? to enter God's kingdom, and you can almost hear the audience gasp. In in fact, Paul himself, who was a Pharisee, he said this about about, about the Pharisees, about himself in Acts Acts 26. He says, they have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion. In other words, he's calling living as a Pharisee. He calls the Pharisees the strictest sect of our religion. And yet Jesus said, unless you're more righteous than the strictest sect of our religion, uh, of this, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. What what could he possibly mean? Because... They're passionate rule keepers. They're, they're the Bible fundamentalists you know, of their day. And their motto is, if the Bible says it, that settles it. And we do it. But according to Jesus, that isn't enough. You've got to go beyond that. Well, Jesus begins to, to, 
to, to make a little bit more sense of, of this in John chapter 5, and he says this in verse 39. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. Okay, he's talking to the Pharisees now. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have eternal life. What Jesus is saying in, in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, is he's, he's saying this. He's saying that we need to live, you know, if, we, if we're gonna be based on works, if we're gonna base ourselves on religion, then we have to be more righteous than the strictest religious sect of, of our time. We have to be more righteous than the Pharisees. If that's how we're gonna live, and then Jesus says this, and they're missing, he says they're missing something. He says to the Pharisees, you're missing something. You think that living by the Bible will give you eternal life. You think that the perfect, living perfectly by the rules and the laws of the Bible is gonna give you eternal life. He says, but you've missed the entire point. That's not what the law is for. That's not what the Old Testament is about. This is why Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it because the law in and of itself is not about the law. It's not about the rules in the law. It's not about gaining eternal life through the law. If it was about that, you'd have to live more righteous than even the Pharisees. It's not about that. He says it's about him. That the entire law and all the scriptures, including the Old Testament, this is why we can't abolish it, because all of the Old Testament points to principles, points to Jesus. It's all about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. That's what he's saying. Now here's, here's another way to look at it, is that, is that rules, okay, think about this, rules only make sense within one context. I'll give you an example. The law in Canada is that we drive on the right-hand side of the road. That's the rules, that's the law. Yet that only works in our context because if you go into England and, dr and drive according to that law, you're gonna have a lot of problem because their laws, in, in that context, that rule doesn't apply. Whereas, Jesus is saying this, principles transcend context. See, a law only works within a context. But principles transcend context. Now, I'll give you another example. We have we, um, been participating in, in a, a wedding recently, and, and my little, my little three-year-old is the flower girl, and she's got this perfect beautiful white dress for the wedding. Now, we say as parents, we said to her, the rule are, she wants to wear it all the time because it's new and it's flashy. We're say, we said to her, the rules are no, you can't, you can't uh, do that. You can't wear that dress because we don't want it to get dirty before the wedding and, and, and you can't wear the dress, you can't wear the dress. Now, because we don't want the dress dirty. We can put that down as a rule in that context, but let me ask you the question now. If, if we told her that that dress, we don't want it dirty, don't get it dirty, don't get it dirty, don't get it dirty, let's put it in a context. Let's say that she has a little friend that falls and, and hurts herself in, in a mud puddle. Is she supposed to live by the rule of not, not getting the dress dirty and, and forget about helping her friend? Don't help your friend because mom and dad have said, I'm wearing the dress. Mom and dad have said, don't get the dress dirty. 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 That can be a rule. The rule only applies. Now, if we said, if we watched her not help her friend, would we be more upset that she didn't help the friend in that context or that she got the dress dirty? Of course, the answer would be in that situation, help your friend because in that context, and this is what Jesus is saying, the context of the law works within the context, but the law is set to serve. The, we don't serve the law. Not getting the dress dir dirty is the rule. We don't serve the rule. The rule serves us. And the law, just what Jesus is saying in that context, Jesus is saying that the law, we don't serve the law. And he says to the Pharisees, you're serving the law and missing the point. And the point isn't the law in and of itself. The point isn't about that. And he says, I didn't come to wipe out the rules and to change all the rules and to say there are no rules. In other words, Jesus is saying, I didn't, I'm not coming here to break all the rules and discard all the rules. The, the rules still have a function within a context. And that function is to point towards him who is the salvation. That function is to, is to lead people and to point people to, the, to Jesus as the Messiah, to Jesus as the hope. The, the law is supposed to serve that context, not the other way around. That you come to God and to salvation 
through rules. No, you come to God in salvation through Jesus. That's why the law can never be abolished because the law points to salvation, not in and of itself, but it point, because it points to Jesus. Matthew 7, verse 12, Jesus said this. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Okay, so Jesus' teaching, and this is known as the golden rule. Okay, we, we call this the golden rule. But the truth is, is that it's, it's more of a principle than it is a rule. Because Jesus is saying you can sum up all of the law and the prophets, all of the Old Testament in this is to do to others what you would have them do to you. And when saying this to the Pharisees, think about the context that he's saying this. In saying this to the Pharisees, what he's actually saying is, is he says, would you want someone to enslave you and to put so many rules and regulations and traditions on you that you could barely live by? Do you want that for, for, for yourself or would you want to have the law serve that and, and bring them into freedom, into salvation, into the life that he promises. See, they're focusing on obeying the rules and often forget to love first. And Jesus came to recalibrate the entire system. And he says, no, 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 we love first and the law serves that love. The law serves, serves me and, and not me serve the law. Now, here's today's takeaway. Rather than give us new rules, Jesus took the principles embedded within the rules and wrapped them up in a human life. Now, let me, let me explain this. Rather than create new rules, and, and a lot of us mistake Jesus as a religious leader, and we think Jesus is you know, the religious leader and that there's a whole bunch, and a lot of you are afraid to come to Christianity because you think that if you come to Christianity, it's a whole bunch of rules and regulations and you have to change your entire life, you have to do all this, and you see it, you, you're afraid of it because you see it as religion. Well, rather that, I, I want to introduce you to Jesus because Jesus came, he came, didn't come to remove all of the rules, he came to give the rules a whole new context. And Jesus didn't give us new rules. He didn't add traditions or rules on top of that. He took the principles embedded within those rules and wrapped them up in messy human life. In other words, if we gave our daughter the rules of not getting the dress dirty and she lived by the rule and forgot to love her friend, that's serving the rules rather than having love. And when it comes to a debate between what do I, do I break the rules or do, what do I do? Do I be a good Christian? Do I associate? Do I not associate? Do I hang out? Do I, do I, do I, how do I respond? And I got to reject and I got to, this is, this is how Christians have behaved in a long time, misrepresented the gospel because we've rejected those who seem outside of the rules and we forgot that love is first and that we forgot that Jesus says, do unto others what they would have them do unto you. W would you rather do unto others? Meaning, you know, would you want others to pick it? because that you didn't agree with them? Would you want others to, to for, for, do unto others? We don't live by the rules and be fo so focused on the rules that you forget to love. We need to love and realize that the law serves Jesus, points to Jesus, and Jesus sets principles wrapped up in them and puts it in messy human life. And truth is, is life is sometimes messy. Life rules and religion tries to make everything so neat and tidy and organized and there's this and there's right and there's wrong and this. But reality is, is life is messy. And the truth is, I love the Bible because the Bible isn't neat and tidy. It shows us the messiness of human life. Yes, it shows us that David killed Goliath, but it also shows us that David had an adult affair and actually committed murder. Yes, it shows us that Gideon was a great man of God, but it also shows us he, he was a drunk and he fell off the, off the, off the wagon. He, 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 was, he was a mess. Yes, it shows us all, all these, these, different, uh, these different people, but it doesn't hide the fact that human life is sometimes messy. And Jesus came along and said, follow the principles, not the letter of the law, we're not abolishing it, we're fulfilling it. We're fulfilling the pr principles in there. And the purpose of the law is to point to Jesus. And the purpose of Jesus is to become the hope. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. And help us to see the principles and help us to look past 
the just being black and white and right and wrong and help us to see beyond that and to see and to put everything in the context of love and put everything in the context of you. Holy Spirit, help us to, to live, move past our human traditions and to get back to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you're with us this morning and you've yet to begin a relationship with Jesus, and again, maybe one of the reasons why you haven't began a relationship with Jesus is because, well, you saw Christianity as another religion. And the truth is, you probably are right. Not because Jesus intended that way, but because us human beings mess it up sometimes. And I want you to know that becoming, joining a relationship with Jesus is not joining a religion, that it's in fact a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship. And I wanna invite you to begin that relationship with, with Jesus this morning. And all you need to do is pray a prayer with me because Paul said this in Romans 10, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is God and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna confess with our mouth in this prayer. And if you pray this prayer with me and you believe in your heart what you're praying is true, you can begin a relationship with Jesus right now. So if you're watching us online, why don't you pray this prayer with me wherever you are and let's pray this together. Everyone repeat this after me. Dear Jesus, I confess that you are God and I believe that you rose again from the dead. And I ask you right now to become my God, my Lord and Savior, and my best friend. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins, for accepting me just as I am. I give my heart to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed this prayer for the first time, I don't embarrass anybody or call anybody out. I can ask everyone to keep their eyes closed and heads bowed. If you prayed this prayer for the first time, just slip up your hand, give me a little wave, and let me know that you prayed this prayer the first time. If you're watching online, you prayed this for the first time, you can just indicate that by clicking the button right below uh, the screen there. And at, by doing that, we'll get in contact with you and we'll be happy to send you a Bible, our free gift to you that explains what this relationship is all about. So excited. Welcome to the family of God. Isn't God so good?